Was Bones About to Defeat Bakura, Shadow of a Duel, by TGS Anime. Bakura versus Bones. An occult deck versus a ghost deck. Well, not a very long duel by any means. Mm -hmm. It is an interesting one. After Bakura claps Bones and takes all of his locator cards, he summons a group of demons to drag Bones and his minions to actual, literal hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yu-Gi-Oh! was metal AF. That's all I'm gonna say. Actually metal AF. 100%. I love it. 100%. Essentially, straight up killing them. This Pretty is confirmed much. not only in the manga, because Bakura just actually just does kill them in the manga, <laughs> but for the rest of the anime, these characters are never seen or heard from again. A pretty sinister fate for, while a scummy character, ultimately, he was a harmless guy. I mean, at the end of the day, what was he doing here? It was just spooking people in a graveyard, causing them to get so scared they dropped their dual discs and locator cards. Technically, yes, when Bakura didn't give up straight away, they did resort to violence. I can't remember where I read mm. this. The reason why Bones has a chip on his shoulder is because due to a glandular problem or something like that, this is why he actually looks like a zombie. And because of this, he's been bullied or mistreated for his entire life. So I can kind of understand why he's become the person he has. Mm -hmm. But did he need to be dragged to hell? Probably not. Because of this. I no, definitely not. And that's why you look at uh, 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 Yami Bakura and you're just like, oh, my God. Like, Bakura is he is such a good villain. Like, I understand why people are just like, you know, across however, what reason you like Bakura because, you know, Bakura aesthetic. Right. But also like, oh, he's such a good villain. Like, he is ruthless. He is merciless. He is dark. You love to hate him. He was very well written, in my opinion. And now have the resolve to fight this injustice and find out if Bones actually did stand a ghost of a chance against Bakura. Or, sadly, was he just in the wrong place at the wrong time and his fate was sealed from the moment the duel began? We won't know unless we jump into the duel. Before the duel begins, the fight begins and Zigor goes first. He lunges at Bakura from behind, <laughs> but Bakura counters by stepping to the side. With Zigor off balance, Bakura reaches forward and unmasks him. Disorientated, Zigor's next action is interrupted, and so Bakura activates his behind the back wrist lock technique. Literally akin to Ash Blossom. Disabling Zigor and winning the fight. However, with Zigor's size and battle experience, keep in mind that he did win a fight against Joey in the earlier season. What he should have done is counter with whatever move this guy does in this video to escape. And by doing that, blah, 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 blah. I'll stop now. I was just <laughs> having a little bit of fun. Sorry. The actual duel. None the no, no, I kind of liked it. It was a good bit. I like that he committed to the bit. 100%. <laughs> The duel begins and Bakura goes first. He draws, and his opening hand consists of Headless Knight, the Shallow Grave, the Earl of Demise, and three mysterious cards. Now, these three cards and the next card that Bakura is going to draw on are never going to be seen or used for the rest of this duel. They are ultimately going to get discarded, so we never find out what they are. Mm. You can assume they are bricks in his hand, so he doesn't need them. So in this case, let's just say they are letters I, N, a and L or sure. E, A, T and H because you're watching the Japanese version right now. So, so yeah, that seems pretty bricky for me. Would make sense. Alternatively, they could be a bunch of monsters or spells and traps that could have helped him, but for the course of the duel, he won't need them. However, this could change if I figure out anything later, which we'll find out a bit later. But for the time being, let's just assume they are the spirit messages cards because he is playing his occult deck and he can't use them, so he's happy to just dump them in the grave. Bakura summons his Headless Knight to the field into attack. He sets his Shallow Grave spell face down and ends his turn. Why set Shallow Grave face down? Well, this is Battle City. Normal spell cards that are set face down become quick play spells during the battle phase and your opponent's next turn. Worst case scenario- You have to understand, it was early Yu-Gi-Oh. It's, it's not dissimilar to, and I've talked about this before, anytime I watch Duelist Kingdom, I actually have an aneurysm. Like, I just, I, I, my brain can't actually handle some of the interactions. But that's strictly because it was, like, less Yu-Gi-Oh, and it was more along the lines of, like, 
D and D RPG with a card game kind of running in tandem with it, right? Like the like logically it makes sense. But when we're talking about like, you know, oh, we're gonna activate Mach the Magical Mist, and it's like, okay, but what does Mach you do? Well, do it rusts all your machine monsters. Does it really though? Does it really well this is also Battle City rules as well. There was definitely a more like coherent game in the anime, but we also had things like effectively summoning sickness, right? Those that play Magic the Gathering, right? Summon can't actually attack, right? But like fusion monsters, right? You know, uh, it famously showcased in Yugi versus Strings, right? Where, oh yeah, cool. I'm going to summon my uh, slime fusion monster. Well, you can't attack. You're right. No, 100%. But activated quick attack the spell card. Now I can attack. I don't know. I don't know how a rule like that in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, a modern like extra deck summoning sickness would actually play out. I think it's an interesting thought process. I think that adds a little more complication to the game than is relevant than the game should have in an in a game that already is complex to a lot of newer players, right? Like looking at, you know, my Heart of the Eyes of Blue that just came in. I mean, it's it's already a paragraph, right? Being able to understand what is cost, what isn't cost, being able to read in sequence. Uh, even then, I had a ruling query recently where, because I play Ubel. I'm 100% a Ubel player. I, I am absolutely a degenerate. I'm a gremlin, if you will. And uh, there was a ruling query that came up. You know, Do you know what the interaction between two zero attack position monsters is? They will smack each other, but because they both have zero, because there is not an actual attack stat there, they'll bounce off of each other. So I was playing against an opponent locally uh, who was using, they were playing the White Forest deck. They were using something to affect Ubel. And because, and so part of the requirement to get the effect in sequence was to lower the attack stat. But how do you can't go negative? So my argument was that's not how that works. Because of this ruling in regards to two zero attack monsters, you can't like they, there's not an attack stat there. However, it was ruled by the judge locally that because that you can still lower it, you don't. There's no lowering that can happen because zero is minimum, right? But the effect would still go off in sequence, even though uh, it required an attack stat to be lowered. So it, it gets weird. J judging and Yu Gi Oh get into such a weedy territory. And even then, like, so, but that's it's always been the case, right? Because we've had us Teller Knight Deneb, that could duelist alliance format was ruled completely differently depending on what part of the world you're in. They've now since consolidated the ruling. But in the US, if you call the haunted Teller Knight Deneb and then chain two, call a, a mystical space typhoon, right, to destroy Call of the Haunted, you would not get the search in the US. But in Europe, you would get the search. So as much as Yu Gi Oh is RTFC, read the freaking card. Sometimes you run into interactions where what happens if you do need to lower their attack stat, right? In sequence, and it's against Ubel. Ubel is is interesting. I can gush about that deck. Ubel is a product of since the deck folds to things like Rageki, Dark Hole, things like that, right? Um, like especially pure Ubel. Ubel is a consequence of modern TCG design. And if the game were to go actually kind of regress back to like a duelist, uh, a duelist alliance, uh, like a Battle City kind of thing, right? Where we have more kind of one offs, you know, more Rageki Dark Hole, I think Yu Bell would actually become less prevalent. You can tell I like talking about Yu Gi Oh! I, I really do. TGS Anime kind of sets up a, a really cool way to talk about things, especially in relation to the anime. Mario Bones really pops off on the next turn, destroys his monster, then attacks directly. At least he can bring his monster back into defense and defend mm -hmm. himself. Which does raise the point, why not set Headless Knight face down into defense? It has 1,700 defense. Mm -hmm. Bones would have had no way of getting rid of this monster and would have probably attacked into it into defense and done more damage to himself. Would have been the optimal play, but a mm, little bit of a misplay from Bakura. You, you could argue it's possibly a bait, especially if there's a follow-up play with that. Does it really matter if Headless Knight is destroyed or not, especially because Bakura runs an occult deck? Um, eventually, he will just hit a point where he has you know critical mass for his plays, and he just goes off, evident by uh, him versus Yugi, right, with his, uh, his whole uh, final strategy, quote-unquote final, right? Uh, being able to have that uh, uh, illusion nightmare field spell, right? That kind of thing. I don't... I, I would say, yeah... Optimally, yeah, you would want to use the the better stat. You could even have done like, well, face down or uh, face up defense position because you can do that in the anime, right? It, it reads as a bait. Bones' turn and he draws. His opening hand consists of the snake hair, armored zombie, crass clown, premature burial, polymerization, and skull invitation. But wow, he didn't actually brick. Bones starts by summoning his snake hair to the field into attack. 
With exactly 50 more attack points, he attacks and destroys Bakura's Headless Knight. Bakura takes the first damage of the duel. With no further plays, Bones ends his turn. Now, straight away, we have a proper misplay here. Bones has summoned his Snake Hair to attack and destroy. However, Snake Hair is a part of his fusion combo. It's a fusion material and he has polymerization in his hand. Ideally, it would be better to hold on to Snake Hair and instead summon Armored Zombie. It has the exact same attack as Snake Hair and it's not a fusion material monster. So why take this risk? Later, he's going to have to use Premature Burial to bring it back. What a waste of a card. So, had he done this, would it have changed the outcome of the duel? Yes, it would have. We'll talk about it later. I can agree with that being a misplay, especially if the attack chat is, uh, stat is interchangeable. If the whole goal is to get a 1500 body on board and just crash, and I'm sure they're both zombie type, right? I'm sure they both have a zombie... Uh... God, it's not attribute. Um, they're typing, right? I'm, I'm, I, I, I see that being interchangeable, and I see that being able to... like. I, I read that initially as... You them wanting to show snake hair and then they're going to use snake hair as a fusion material as, uh, you know, hey, it's on the field, right? Kind of like how um, Kaibas in Duelist Kingdom, right? Summons his three is a... Uh, does he summon his three blowers? I don't actually remember the duel on the tower anymore. What I'm trying to get at is the whole argument of uh, the show not tell, right? Showing us snake hair, being able to gain that advantage and then using snake hair to make a fusion play even though it's the detrimental play from a cinematic standpoint, from an actual like anime standpoint, I can kind of see the large train they might be on. It's Bakura's turn and he draws a mysterious card that we have all agreed is Spirit Message H, okay? Mm -hmm. So he's got all of the pieces of Destiny Board in his hand that he doesn't need right now. Bakura activates his set, The Shallow Grave. Due to its effect, both players special summon a monster from their grave to their field into face-up defense. Right, which he would need something in his graveyard to activate, right? So that's why he would bait with uh, Headless Knight. Bakura brings back his Headless Knight. Since Bones has no monsters in his graveyard, he has nothing he is allowed to summon back to the field. It's worth mentioning, in the real world, this play would not be possible, as the... That's what I thought. It depends on cost of activation. If the requirement is both players target one card in their graveyard and then apply effect, if, if no valid target exists, you can't do it, right? I cannot drop a Dark Beckoning Beast to... Uh, so, say, so activate Dark Beckoning Beast. I play you, Bell, right? Dark Beckoning Beast, search out opening the Spirit Gates. I have two opening the Spirit Gates in hand. I only run max two. I cannot actually activate my second opening the Spirit Gates if there is no co there are no copies in my deck. That's why you have certain things that shuffle it back, right? Like, you have certain things to uh, dig them out. Uh, some people even try to run a uh, another... Like, I think they run, like, was it... They're not running. I think it's Chaos Summoning Beast. I think they run. There's a couple techs that they'll run. I think even some people are running Chaos Core at one because they're trying to get all the targets. It's it's interesting, but yeah, no, this is 100 percent a thing. If you if the cost is not able to be met, you cannot activate a card. It's why I actually get really, really annoyed that Dante Burning Abyss Dante actually can get his effect off. Um, or I guess get Burning Abyss effects off because even though Dante's effect can be negated, let's say you let's say you effect Veiler Dante, right? You can still activate effect, discard your two your uh, Ixy material as cost, and then his effect will be negated. That is that has been a rule that has been around forever, right? I'm not going to be able to change that. I do disagree being able to do that though. You are activating the effect, but if the effect is negated, like how how do you word it in a way? Or what if, how do you uh, uh, change the effects in a way that you cannot even activate an effect? You're still able to activate an effect. So then we get into the design argument of are these treated as a vanilla or is that if they try to activate the effect, they are thus unable to do it. I think there's a valid clarification that needs to happen there. Because yeah, absolutely, go try it out in Master Duel. Go try it out in uh, any sort of uh, simulator, right? Dante, effect negated, even if you have skill drain on the board, right? So you can actually set this up yourself. Skill drain, Dante, or I guess any Ixie as well that has an activated effect, um, it, it's especially prevalent with Burning Abyss because once it detaches, because the Ixy material goes to the graveyard, it'll feed the Burning Abyss plays. So, yeah, no, I, I the, the the cost thing he absolutely brings up, and I was thinking it just before I mentioned it. I'm like, I don't know if you can do that. It depends how the card is worded, but yes, if there is no cost that can be met, you will not be able to make the play. Real World Shallow Grave states that you have to have a valid target in both players' graveyards to use this effect. Mm. So Bakura wouldn't be allowed to use it in the real world. But this is the anime. Its anime effect has a big old 
can in its card text, so he is allowed to do this, even mm -hmm. if the opponent doesn't have a target. The, the monster on Bakura's side of the field. He tributes it to summon his Earl of Demise. He enters his battle phase and orders Earl of Demise to attack and destroy Bones' snake hair. Bakura ends his turn. It's back to Bones, and he draws Dragon Zombie. Strangely, he summons it to the field. Mm -hmm. Next, he plays Premature Burial. Now, at the cost of 800 life points, he can bring back one monster in his grave. He brings back Snake Hair. With both Snake Hair and Dragon Zombie, he is now able to activate Polymerization. See, this is why I think that this goes towards more of like an anime showcasing thing rather than an actual relevant play. Because if Armored Zombie was... So if Armored Zombie was the one that got played... He would, he'd be able to summon dragon, even then, why, he doesn't really even need to summon dragon, that eats up his normal summon, he'd be able to shotgun polymerization this turn, be able to fuse both of them, wait, it would be the optimal play, but I think it's the less flashy play, I don't think that it advances the duel in the same way that this does, right, like, you can kind of see, oh, well, Earl of Demise just smacks snake hair, right, okay, turn change, standby phase, uh, draw phase, standby phase, main phase, normal summon, zombie dragon, uh, premature burial, pay 800 life points, right? Be able uh, summon snake hair back, then activate polymerization. You could absolutely argue suboptimal, right? I think that it it showcases a advancement of the duel. It showcases uh, Bones trying to build his board. It showcases progress being made from his plays. That's how at least that reads to me. Suboptimal, but flashy. He merges both of them together to make Great Mammoth of Goldfine. A fusion monster. Right, this is the era of fusions that didn't make sense. Oh god, I missed this. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, there's so many of these. With no effect, but with 2200 attack, it's more than enough to get over Bakura's Earl of Demise. Or at least, that would have been the case, as unfortunately, due to Battle City rules, fusion summoned monsters can't attack the turn they are summoned. And so, planning to go on the offensive on the next turn, Bone sets his Skull Invitation Trap face down and ends his turn. The not the summoning sickness or fusion monsters reads as Kaiba being uh I guess on an ego trip because Kaiba notoriously had like blue eyes ultimate dragon right he can fuse his blue eyes together like that's something that he can and has been known to do so I feel like that is something that like he would be like yeah no I will nerf myself that that's how that always read to me that's kind of my head cannon as I pointed out at the start of this turn Bones didn't need to waste his normal summon with summoning dragon zombie on the field just to fuse you don't have to do that you no. can fuse with monsters in your hand it is weird that he did this because if he hadn't done it he would still have his fusion monster on the field but he'd still have a normal summon yeah. he could use that normal summon to summon his crass clown into face up defense so why would that help? Well, it puts Bakura in an awkward situation. With two monsters that are able to deal with his monster on the next turn, he has to get rid of one of them. If he doesn't get rid of Mammoth of Goldfine, he'll attack over his 2000 attack monster and destroy it. If he doesn't get rid of the Crass Clown, he can switch it into attack, bounce Earl of Demise back to Bakura's hand, and now he's emptied the field again. It's one of those situations where, knowing what happens on the next turn, he will only be able to boost his one monster's attack higher and he won't be able to deal with two monsters. So if he would have got both out, would it have changed the outcome of the duel? Yes, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well when the moment is right. So I think it's interesting when you look at things like this, when you look at these duels where you go, are they misplaying because the writing is bad or are they misplaying because they are presented as a less skilled duelist? And I think there's a valid argument for they are presenting it in a way that is going to be form over function, flash over actual uh, substance, right? But they're also doing it in a way that could showcase who is or isn't less skilled, right? Because if everybody was a Yugi, right? Like if everyone was playing optimally, what's what's the challenge in that? What's the character growth that happens in that, right? If everyone in Duelist Kingdom was Maximilian Pegasus and was doing 300 IQ plays in regards to... Uh, you know, uh, doing this and doing this and do that. And there were attempts like, you know, uh, Weevil Underwood being able to, uh, you know, do his whole insect strategy, make a tsunami taking advantage of the moon, right? Like, there were, there, it's not that, like, they, they showcase that they're experienced, but it showcases that there are people that are just next level. There's cognizance of the rule set, right? Being able to fuse uh, into uh, uh, Mammoth Goldfine, right? But it doesn't showcase finesse, experience, and mastery where someone like Bakura is going to be able to just dance or all around bones, right? These are what that's why he is a battle city finalist, despite him kind of cheating to get there effectively. Right. 
hundred percent. There has to be bad plays. There's always a table 500. My ideal Yu-Gi-Oh is table 500, but we're all sitting around eating steak dinners. Okay. hundred percent adult Yu-Gi-Oh, if you will. And that's not to insinuate that any sussiness happens. We got table 500 homeboys eating a, fi- a steak dinner. I saw, I saw a photo of it recently. I don't know if I can find it again. There was literally a photo of dude at like table 500, quite literally just eating a steak dinner. Somebody's got, you know, the, 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 the fine beverage, you know, swishing it around in a glass. You know, everyone just dirtles for 45 minutes per game, has a fun time. I, that, that to me is, is more Yu-Gi-Oh than, uh, some some people uh, have led to believe, right? Absolutely, there's a competitive scene, but sometimes the competitive scene isn't exactly the most fun, which is fine. You know, different things for different people. Absolutely, um, but there are absolutely less skilled players, and even then, even if you're not a skilled player, you should have every. Oh, here I found it. You should have every incentive, every reason to be able to to play the game. Even if you're just playing table 500. Dude, having a steak dinner mid-match. What an absolute legend. First off, obviously, be respectful of your opponent. Be able to, you know, be nice, be kind, be courteous. You know, don't get steak juice over somebody else's cards, right? Like, kind of relevant things. Like, you know, respectful things. This is the Yu-Gi-Oh! I crave, though. Dude is absolutely living his best life. And I, I love this. This this is Yu-Gi-Oh! This is actually peak Yu-Gi-Oh! But... Back to, uh, back to Bakura Bones. It's Bakura's turn, and he draws Spiritualistic Medium. Bones, wasting absolutely no time, immediately activates his set trap, Skull Imitation. Due to its continuous effect, now, whenever a card or cards are sent to the grave, the owner of those cards takes 300 damage for each one sent. Bakura, absolutely fine with this, activates his Spiritualistic Medium spell. This lets him send his entire hand to the grave in order to increase the attack of one monster he controls mm-hmm. by 500 for each cent. This effect lasts until the end of the turn. Bakura sends his entire hand to the grave. Since there were four cards in it, Skull Invitation deals 300 damage for each. Whereas Earl of Demise gains 500 attack for each. Real quick, little bit of an error here. Bakura's life points dropped to 2,750, but Mm -hmm. they should have actually dropped to 2,450, meaning he should have took 1,500 damage because the spell card also went to the graveyard. Ah, ah, that's relevant. Okay, no, that's absolutely true. It's why uh, Pot of Greed is only a plus one. What do you mean Pot of Greed is only a plus one? It clearly says to draw two cards. Correct. However, how do you get to draw two cards? You have five cards in hand. One card is Pot of Greed, right? You will play Pot of Greed. You go down to four cards in hand. Effect, draw two. Effect resolves. Card five, card six, discarding Pot of Greed from field to grave. Pot of Greed is a plus one. It is a card you have to use to draw two. Card economy. It's it's actually card advantage is a whole subject in itself, which is why we get into people that say, "What is it? Pot of is it desires? Oh, pot of desires is a negative eight. Is it though? Is it really that? That's been a whole debate in Yu Gi Oh. Um, but yeah, no, hundred percent. Like, yeah, that that is absolutely a a actual clerical mathematical error because it is a card. That's another card going to the grave. That should have been another three hundred damage. Did it matter in the overall long run at all? No. Is it a little bit of an error though? Yes. Now, the 4,000 attack, Earl of Demise, attacks and destroys Great Mammoth of Goldfine. The effect of Skull Invitation activates since Goldfine went to the grave. Mm -hmm. With no further plays, as Bakura has nothing left in his hand, he ends his turn. And honestly, the background of this duel as well, thematically, this is Bakura just kind of showing up, not dealing with this this spooky funhouse that Bones and Co. are putting on, and him putting the fear into them. This is Bakura coming in and rising up over them and absolutely just towering over them and smashing into them. Like the, the subtext is really, really great. And it showcases in the play style as well. Bones is less experienced. Bakura is going to capitalize on sure. Bakura is taking far, you know, a lot of damage where he's willing to discard four cards uh, to spiritual, uh, spiritualistic medium, his Earl of demise, but it showcases a character. He is like kind of an ends justifies the means kind of character. And thus he, just doesn't care. He is just far more metal than Bones and his crew. As he does, Earl of Demise's attack returns to normal. Now here is where we actually get a cool out of dual moment that is quite rare for the series. To the best of my knowledge, we have never seen anybody try to escape a shadow duel when they think they're about to lose. They just try to fight it out. And that's all we ever get. Mm-hmm. Well, for the first time, we actually get to see what happens if someone tries to escape. As it turns out, 
you can't escape. The only way to get out is to win or lose. So I would say we do actually get to kind of see that the shadow games, quote unquote, are kind of their own little personalized dimension. Because in Duelist Kingdom, I think it was, was it, I think it was Joey, right? Because uh, this is after Pegasus is like, fine, let's continue. Yugi boy, let's continue this in the shadows, right? I, I, I sounded like Kage Mara from GX rather than, than Pegasus. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, but Joey runs forward and he comes out the other side. He kind of just teleports through. So we know that they're kind of an enclosed system. So this showcases, he's absolutely right in the fact that we don't really see people try to escape it. But that same closed system logic that we're seeing here, him running off screen and then coming back from uh, off screen top, right? is showcased in Duelist Kingdom because it is a closed system. And so, it's Bones' turn and the penultimate turn of the duel. He draws and gets Nightmare Steel Cage. With no way of getting over the Earl of Demise and hoping to buy himself more time to draw a card that can turn the duel around, he activates his Nightmare Steel Cage. You can even see that he's, he's clearly shaking. Like, Bakura has him spooked. The, 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 rever the role reversal here is real. Trying to spook Bakura, but Bakura spooks him back. Now, for the next two turns, neither player can declare an attack. Bone sets a mysterious monster face down that is either Class Clown or Armored Zombie. Since Armored Zombie has zero defense, I have to assume it was Crass Clown. And with that, Reasonably. he ends his turn there. And here it is, the culmination of all the misplays that Bones has made throughout this entire duel end here. The me, the me theme here goes hard. I appreciate it. This moment right here could have been very different if he was a better duelist. Mm -hmm. How? I hear you cry. Uh, like so. Had Bones played the Crass Clown in defense last turn, like I suggested, instead of wasting his normal summon, he could now switch that monster into attack. Due to its effect, it would bounce Earl of Demise back to Bakora's hand. He could then summon Armored Zombie and then attack directly with both of his monsters, dealing 2,850 damage. Wait, Since both. Bakura only has 2,750 left, that would mean Bones would win the duel. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's one fatal flaw with his logic, though. Yu-Gi-Oh! players do not read. We, we do not read. Reading is cheating. And in this new alternate <laughs> reality, Bones is now the one to duel against Yugi in the first round of the Battle City Finals. I do like this analysis, though. Joking aside, I think that is a solid analysis, and I think there is a strong case that Bones could have won here if Bones wasn't spooked, wasn't frightened, but also was just better. Because he clearly didn't have the skill that Bakura had. Bakura, honestly, kind of took a gamble. So you could argue that that as character uh, development, Bakura being completely over cocky, uh, being this absolute, you know, I am untouchable, uh, means justify, or sorry, ends justify the means, um, willing to take those risks. That's wacky, right? And it's kind of nice as well, because I guess he would have won Bakura's most valuable cards. He'd probably take the Destiny Board's cards off of him, and that kind of works for Bones as well. Mm -hmm. That's kind of fun to think about. There's more, however. The cherry on top of the cake is that had he not wasted the premature burial earlier in the duel, like I suggested, he would still have it right now and so he could activate it to bring back his fusion monster. Now, I'm not actually 100% sure if a previously fusion summoned monster brought back and special summoned to the field can attack the same turn it's brought to the field. Technically, the wording is fusion summoned monsters can't attack the turn they are summoned, so I guess maybe they can't, but I can't think of any examples off the top of my head, so you'll have to I can't think of them either. I'm trying to remember if there was like a did they did like Yugi Monster Reborn something or did Joey like Monster Reborn like Thousand Dragon or something. I don't remember in Battle City. I don't think there's a yeah not offhand. I don't see I don't see a fusion monster example of that. I think that it depends how the Japanese it was worded, how it was worded in Japanese, and it also depends because a fusion summon monster could be referring to an older Yu-Gi-Oh as a monster from the fusion deck. Remember, it didn't used to be the extra deck. It used to be the fusion deck. The extra deck was a fairly modern thing in comparison. Kind of like PCXT, uh, sorry, PSCT Prop Summon Cartex was a more modern thing about Duelist Alliance. Let me know in the comment section below if his fusion monster could attack on the same turn it's premature burial. But regardless, it's a nice little monster to have on his side of the field yeah. and its protection should anything go wrong, which it can't because Bakura has no back row and no cards in hand. So there you go. Yes, Bones technically could have won this duel. However, mm -hmm. with all that in mind, in Bakura's defense, 
prior to him activating spiritualistic medium and dumping his entire hand into the grave. Seeing that Bones now has two monsters on his side of the field, he might have been able to use one of those cards in his hand mm -hmm. before using it. Because at the end right. of the day, he only needed to discard one card to be strong enough to attack over Bones' fusion monster. Right, we are looking at this in a vacuum. That is a very correct thing to call out, 100%. We are looking at this in a vacuum. We have no idea what the other cards in his hand are. He could have had an out. He could have had Raigeki for all we know. Right, reasonably probably not, right? But it is something that is good to bring up. So it all depends on what his other cards were. Were they bricks in his hand? In which case, his fate was sealed. Did he have more monsters? Because it did seem like he was toying with bones, wanted the duel to last as long as possible. So that could be the case. It's hard to say, but yeah. With that all wrapped up, it's time to move to Bakura's turn and the final turn of the duel. He draws and gets the field spell, Ectoplasma. He activates it. Now, both players contribute up to two monsters per turn with different types. Half of the tributed monster's attack is dealt as damage to the opponent. Bakura activates its effect by declaring Fiend. He tributes his only Fiend monster on the field, the Earl of Demise. 1000 damage is dealt to Bones, dropping his life points down to zero. Bakura wins the duel. Bones and his companions are killed. <laughs> it's a shame this duel's so short, but it is a fun yet spooky duel for the season. Uh, it's pretty cool. And I was shocked to find out that, yeah, Bones could have won this duel. But again, it all depends on what those mysterious cards were in Bakura's hand. Since we don't know, I don't know. Want to learn more about Bakura's iconic Destiny board cards? I have a video right here. Or do you want to see me actually try to win with these cards in Master Duel's ranked mode? It's really hard. I'm really trying, yes. but I'm I'm trying to, all right? Check it out if you want to. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Catch you later. Any sort of legacy thing like that is just going to be kind of wild to get off. So I give him mad props for even attempting to. I know people are going to be like, well, are you going to do it yet? Are you going to do it? Bro, the fact that he's attempting to do it is actually kind of nutty. I'm here sitting, you you know, playing you bell fortress dot deck, right? <laughs> it's... <laughs> I dirtle for so long to get my plays. Oh my god, it's just gonna get weirder as time goes on and Master Duel Bell gets more support. However, we might also see a phantom hit. We're gonna see what happens. We we could potentially see some hits if Yu Bell is that omnipresent. However, this was amazing. Very good spooky video for the season. I got to talk about Yu-Gi-Oh for a bit. That's always gonna be a plus. As somebody who has a couple of videos over on Kip YGO, in the description you'll see a link to it. It's another channel that I try to run. It's nothing big, but I just make Yu-Gi-Oh short some time to time. I also ended up ordering the entire uh, Fiend Smith package. So a like on this video <laughs> would go a long way. Shameless plug for my addiction to Yu-Gi-Oh. Actually, as I have a like, card of the blue eyes sitting right here, I gotta add to Exodia later. I've been wanting to do a lot more Yu-Gi-Oh content. It's been really cool. Um, I know competitive is kind of in a slump right now, but that goes back to what I was saying earlier in the video. You don't have to be competitive to enjoy the game, even if you just want to play old Exodia, Royal Magical Library, even if you just want to play you know, I'm going to throw 60 card jank together and we're going to play. If you want to play, you know, things like Infernoid, Magnet Warriors, uh, Magicians, Blue Eyes, right? You should absolutely be able to, you know, feel accepted and valid in any way you want to play Yu-Gi-Oh!, you know, there's there's more ways to play than just competitive, more ways to play than, than just goat, you know, you know, buy some structure, three, three of a structure deck, like the lights were in structure deck, right? It's up in my closet right now that I haven't done anything with. Buy three of those, smash them together in the best way you can see fit. Have it out with your friends, right? Yu-Gi-Oh! is such a such a more diverse card game than I think a lot of people give it credit for. And I think part of that has to do with the focus on competitive culture, which is really sad to think about and then we have Yu-Gi-Oh uh who which you know why does Yu-Gi-Oh work in other series fail and I think that Yu-Gi-Oh works because not only does it deal with some incredibly mature themes such as the Shadow Realm censorship right um but it also deals with character development during the fight right not everyone is at the top of their game there are people like Bones who are less skilled and are definitely making mistakes and misplays and you can see the characterization of you uh, have Bakura towering over bones and causing him to shake and even potentially misplay further, right? Where you can have this characterization mid duel, you know, conversations during fight scenes, very anime esque, right? Obviously. But I think that the characterization and the mat themes involved with those characters, like Bakura literally having an occult deck, right? Uh, Maximilian Pegasus being able to have funny, cutesy tune deck, right? Um, and then, you know, going into his darker Elma by using, you know, Black Illusion Ritual, getting out, uh, you know, uh, uh, Relinquished, uh, Thousand Eyes Restrict, right? Those kind of things. 
where you can have characterization. It is effectively an extension of oneself. View it less as they're actually drawing from a 40 card deck and more fighting each other with ideology, right? Where you have Pegasus, you know, getting kind of back to the wall, wanting to close out the game is going to summon relinquished and Jigen Bakudan, right? You have Bakura who is willing to, you know, hurt himself more for a perceived win um in order to uh just absolutely uh shatter his opponent's nerves right to fray them so view it less as in like what's the statistical probability of kaiba drawing all three blue eyes and more he's in a duel against yugi he's probably going to summon all three of his blue eyes because this is kind of what their characters do this is their warring ideology right uh or blue eyes versus uh red eyes if you know it's it's kaiba versus joey that's probably going to come up the the uh the the the, the Kaiba archetype being with his blue eyes versus Joey, you know, uh, red eyes signifying the underdog kind of thing, right? There's a whole blue eyes versus red eyes parallel, but that all that is just a, a short blurb on the depth of Yu-Gi-Oh! And I think why a lot of us like it, a lot of themes presented, a lot of justification, just a lot of things brought to the table. I don't think a lot of other series can, and it is kind of sad to see competitive in the state that it is, but I do absolutely encourage anybody, if you are curious about Yu-Gi-Oh!, definitely people like TGS Anime are such a cool way to kind of bridge the TCG with the anime. I, I would not say it if I don't believe it. I actually really like his content. I don't react to TGS Anime a lot, not because I don't like his content. I absolutely adore it. I just have to prioritize certain things uh, for the React channel, right? So it's always good to see this, and especially a good way to help kind of finish out uh, Spooktober. So thank you all for watching. If Yu-Gi-Oh is your thing, uh, we're talking about it pretty regularly over in the Discord at this point in time. Let me know what your favorite deck from Battle City was. Let me know what your favorite modern deck is. Let me know if you think I'm a stinky player for playing Yubel. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.